Welcome back ladies and gents. In this video, I talk with professional footballer Terence Smith. Terence has played for clubs such as the Tulsa Roughnecks in the USL, the Michigan Stars in the NISA, and he has also been called up to represent the Barbados national football team. In this video, he discusses the pathway he took to become a professional, he discusses the challenges he had to overcome playing college sport, and he also gives you some golden advice on how you can make it as a professional. So, let's dive in. All right, guys, welcome back. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, I am joined with professional footballer Terence Smith. Terence, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much for joining us, mate. Really appreciate that. So, Terence, what I think the best place to start is I'm going to pass it over to you just to introduce yourself, name, age, position, and where you're currently playing. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Terence Smith. I'm uh, 29 years old, born in Canada, but uh, represent the Barbados national team. Uh, I play center back, and I'm currently playing at Michigan Stars in NISA Soccer League in the States. Awesome. Great stuff, mate. And uh, how's all that going? Is your season's just wrapped up? Am I right? Or yeah, season ended um, uh, early October. Yeah, uh, it was okay. It was very uh, scattered around with the COVID. Um, mm. You know, trying to sort sort out a schedule with the league and that. So it wasn't uh, what I originally envisioned in a season. Playing, you know, whatever thirty thirty five games and. Uh, getting exposure and getting out there but uh it was the best that they could do uh due to the circumstances yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're not alone there right that's impacted the whole world the whole footballing right. world really so yeah exactly. at least they managed to get some games going i mean our where mm -hmm. i am over here in melbourne in victoria we we had probably the longest pre-season you've ever had i think we started in like december time and then um, the season would normally start in like March, April, somewhere like that. Mm. And we'd stop for a bit, come back, stop, come back. So we were still doing pre-season in like June. <laughs> and and wow. then they canned the season. So we didn't even get to play a game. So, yeah. Wow. At least, at least so you that's the, the A-League? No, nah, not, not for me, mate. That would be nice. But no, I no, play no. semi-professional. So um, for me, it's okay. um, I play the MPL is kind of like the level down. And I'm, I'm beneath that in the state leagues. Yeah. Getting on, you know, 35 years old, mate, these legs. That's cool. <laughs> and the lack of technical yeah. ability as well. But anyway, hey, so what, where yeah, I like to start, as long as you're enjoying yourself. That's right, yeah. Where I like to start, mate, is really taking it all the way back and just hearing about how you got involved in football. Where did it all begin for you? Where did it all begin? I must have been probably five years old. And my mom kind of... <laughs> sign me up me and my cousin like that's my earliest memory of, of football um i have a, a funny a funny picture as a kid like a, a kind of a rookie card and that's like the earliest memory i have it in canada it's called like the tim bits league or something which is um uh, i don't know you've probably never heard of tim hortons or something but a very popular uh chain around here and so it was like uh, the tim bits league so yeah it's just like a little house league and I was probably five. That's all I can really remember about it. Yeah. And uh, what's the, uh, I guess, for, as a youngster, what's that kind of pathway for you? Was it all, um, are there a lot of academies, professional clubs, scouting, or is it all just kind of local league, local community clubs? Um, well, growing up uh, from Canada, uh, it's always been evolving like where Canada is now is crazy from when I was younger in terms of they have a professional league now but it's only been around two years and the academies and even if you think of MLS Toronto FC is probably 10 years old at this point maybe so yeah. I'm 29 so think about like you know mm. it, it wasn't really around when I was coming up or it was just kind of starting when I was 14 15 16 so um, there was academies around, but nothing that I was really a part of growing yeah. up, at least at my earlier stages, right? Yeah. So, so how, where I was does just the, kind of playing, right? You're just kind of playing. Yeah. And where does the influence for football come then? If it's not um, so pre like prevalent in Canada and there's, 
you know, it's not a big following like in England. Obviously, it's massive. It's the number one sport. But, you know, clearly at that point in Canada, it's not. Where does your influence or your family's influence to get you into football start? Honestly, I mean, it just kind of it just kind of came from being active in Canada. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the play, pay to play type system that is in North America, uh, Canada and America. So if you think about it, um, basketball, you just need a basketball uh you know what po what's very popular over here is hockey but hockey all the equipment you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars right mm -hmm. so i think soccer was more so you just, just need a ball right yeah. and some shin guards and you're pretty much good to go yeah. so i think that's really what made my mom sign me up it was the cheapest way from uh, the active i think yeah yeah makes sense so when does I guess as a youngster, was it your, if you're not surrounded by that, you know, the football and the, all the stars and the lights and all the rest of it in Canada, was it always your intention that you wanted to become a professional footballer as a young kid? Or is it just something that as you've got older and it's progressed in your career? Um, it was one of those weird things. Uh, it didn't really hit me until maybe I was late into my teens. Like, cause, um, you know, Cool. you're playing a bunch of different sports right you don't even really know what you're good at really because like I said there is no pro academies or anything around at that point so you don't even know if you're good enough mm -hmm. so and younger you're just you're playing everything you're playing soccer you're playing basketball you're running track I played uh American ball things like that like it's just it's just something that kind of started gravitating towards me at some point but there was nothing, there was no type of moment where I was like, oh, that's, this is why I love it. Like, it was just kind of what I chose, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and do you think being involved in all those different sports has, has helped you become a, you know, a well-rounded oh. athlete? In a sense, yeah. But then also, like, as, as I get older, obviously, and you start to look around at other parts of the world and you start to see, like, the, the the technical training they may have been doing when they were 10 and 11 and 12 when I was just running around in a park uh you know playing basketball or something mm -hmm. sometimes I wonder well if I was doing all those things when I was at Cruyff turns and like all these robotic things that they're having these kids do at these academies like where would I really be if you pair that with athleticism right yeah. so yeah it's something to think about right it's helped but Obviously, in the back of my mind, if I, I wonder if I did grow up in uh, England, like how far progressed I would I would be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you had started more focused technical training at a bit of a younger exactly. age. Yeah. I think there's definitely a balance to be had where multiple sports obviously gives you that the well roundedness of athleticism, mm -hmm. all the rest of it, coordination, all the rest. But having that focused technical work. I think exactly. yeah, I, I think I'm the same, you know, coming up when, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have any of these private academies or anything like that. You know, it was always just your local club. And you always wonder, like, if you had access to what is available now for the youngsters, how different would you turn out as a player? Because exactly. mm. uh, my friend's a trainer. So even occasionally I'll go uh, help him train some kids, whether it be like seven, eight, nine, ten. They're doing, you know, really technical drills and they're obviously not great at it but imagine when the teen if we're doing it three times a week now right i was never doing those type of things i was just playing video games running in the park um you know little things like that right so yeah i think you're right so talk us through then as a as a youngster where your kind of journey into your first i guess um proper football team would be like how old were you was it a college was it school um, obviously no disrespect to my other teams, but I feel like the first time I was in like a proper setup, which was like pretty close to pro, I was 17. Right. Okay. So that would have been the, the Academy, Toronto Academy at the time. Toronto and where, sorry? Toronto Lynx Academy. Toronto Lynx. Okay. So it, it's since, um, disbanded into, uh, it's called Oakville Blue Devils. So, okay. but at the time, like, my first day pulling up to the the Toronto Lynx Academy, like it was really eye opening. Like 
just just seeing the drills they were doing everyone's they're they're paying long balls across the field and doing all types of things and all types of I was like wow like what's going on here like you just kind of start to question like am I even good enough to do what these guys are doing right now Mm. and I think just the whole atmosphere of it um the gear the travel the the level of competition because we would be playing like Chicago Fire under 17s or under 20s just the 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 traveling to the states just the whole preparation staying in hotels uh the tactics of it yeah, I was that was the first time I would say it was really I was really in proper club yeah and talk to us about how you how you got to there how, what was your journey to that you know, to arriving in the car park there how did you how did that happen so essentially um anything like like I say that's my first proper club but of course along the way like I've played with players and good teams um they just lack that professionalism and I've I've had teams bring in let's say guest trainers that were really good or really high level and so you know it, but um obviously just playing and progressing and uh one day with one of my teams we had a uh, kind of like one of those guest trainers that would come, one of the old players, they they came in from that that Toronto Lynx team, which was essentially they had academies, but it is semi pro at the time, what was called a PDL in America. PDL. Yeah, yeah, so, PDL, yeah. Premier Development League. Yeah. Which was, you know, one of the top leagues at the time, even though it's semi pro. Went to like whatever MPS styles and things like that today. Yeah. And so that someone from that PDL. Who was that you were playing the PDL? Toronto Lynx. So eventually oh, I right. progressed from the 17s to the 20s. Yes. Gotcha. So it was like proper coming up, like you're in an academy, like you're mm. coming up, right? Yeah. But any case, so how I got to Toronto Lynx or how I got into that parking lot, um, someone from the Toronto Lynx came to speak to our team. And I, I guess I was 16 at the time. And he just kind of had a speech for us. And he kind of said that, you know, all I remember from his speech is him saying that if you can go to a higher level, you should go. Like, don't worry about anything else. And so I guess I kind of looked into Toronto Lynx. Like, I'm not 100% sure. It's a little bit fog, but I, I just I went with it for it to see what it was about, what this higher level was about, right? Mm. So that's to answer your question, how I got, yeah. I guess, to the, 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 the first session or the first to get involved yeah. with the team. Uh, and what's going through your head? I know when you've got there, you're like, you know, Jesus, this is a, a different level to, you know, it's a step up and you're you know, impressed by the pinging of the balls and everything. But on the journey there, how are you feeling? Like what's going through your head, your thoughts the night before? Are you nervous? I don't think I was nervous because I didn't know what to expect, right? But obviously getting there, you start to see the way it's organized. It has to be organized because there's multiple academy team pitch, but it's still fluid training, right? There's still a lot going on in a fluid sense. So I think that was overwhelming, like seeing the numbers. And let's say you see 40 kids or 40 players all in the same type of uh, and all the coaches in there and they're nice training kit and it's all very professional right mm. but going to it I, I didn't know what to expect so I don't remember being nervous or anything yeah and then how did it go I, I did well from what I remember probably played played a bit played scrimmage and yeah I well it was like a, a tryout but yeah. like I was confident I was comfortable I was uh, supposed to be like right mm. And and this was um, – so you got invited because you had one of the coaches come in, a guest coach come in, said you can, if you can progress, you should. Is that right? Is that yeah, how it was something, something along those lines. That part of how I eventually got there is a little bit foggy. The, <laughs> the main thing why – I remember my main why for showing up yeah, was because of, of that guy, yeah, right? Yeah. And ironically enough, he played center back. I played center back eventually three years later we feature together oh yeah in the pdl yeah oh, so that's great. it's just the weird things right yeah 
and I don't know if he ever even knows that or remembers that, right? Because he's just a guest speaker, right? Yeah. It's just whatever to him. He's just coming out to see a random team. I don't know if he ever knew that mm-hmm. I was the guy. I was the reason why he was there, and now we're playing together. Yeah, yeah. So. That um, I think that's also something really powerful that a lot of coaches don't realize is the impact that you have on younger youngsters, younger players. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be, you know, ten, eleven, twelve to have that impact. You can still you can be a bit older as a player. Um, but what you say to the players really matters because I know I've got messages yeah. that I've carried with me the whole way through my footballing, um, shall we call it, career, which mm. I was told when I was, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old, you know. So it's, you have to be really mindful as a coach about what you're saying to your players because I think it really does have a massive impact. Yeah, it's, it's true. Mm. And I guess if he's watching, uh, uh, Lorenzo is the one that... Uh, from Toronto Lynx, who came out and... What was his name? Because you cut out there. Say that again. All right. Uh, Eric Del Lorenzo. Eric. Well, hopefully Eric sees this and he can know what... Uh, he sees this. Influence. He's this. He's the reason why. Yeah. So, talk to us about there. So, the trial goes well. I'm assuming you yeah. sign and you play. How long do you spend there? Yeah. So, yeah. I think I was 16, 17, so... Originally, you just start finding your feet. So I was just playing in the teens, right? The under 17s. And I probably, that summer, you know, then I started to get incorporated with the U20s a bit, but take long for me to be on the PDL team and like actually featuring against some of the top at the time, the D1 prospects in mm-hmm. North America. Mm-hmm. And I was only 17, right? So it was kind of yeah. like, it was, Imagine, like, you're just playing around at 16 and at 17. You're playing against, like, some of the top players in mm. the States, right? Yeah. So, it's all, from all over the world, right? So, and, and at that I, time, PDL was so – they took it – PDL was almost pro, like, because there was nothing really else around, right? Yeah. Yeah, and were you studying at the time as well? Were you at college or anything? I was uh, – this was, I guess, my grade 12 year in high school. Right. So I was about to be going into college. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I don't want to get off too much off topic. Like, uh, yeah, so I was, yeah, I was in school at the time. So, yeah. Right. Okay. And did you go down the, the college? Because I know over in America, obviously, it's, um, and, and I'm assuming potentially in Canada, it's similar where the college is, sport is, is big. Is that right? Yeah. Um, again, at the time, uh, Canadian universities didn't offer any type of scholarships from what I remember. So you almost had to go to the NCAA, right. which again yeah. now is not a thing really, because now it's almost, it's almost better to be, to, for, to get drafted by the CPL. Right. So it's like these little minor things that have changed over the course of time, right. At that time, NCAA, it's like, you had to go to the States. You had to, you had to. And so that yeah. is what I did. At that yeah. time, yeah. yeah. So the opportunities are, are uh, they're starting to develop now in Canada, right? There, you yeah. don't have to go across to. No, America it's almost it's almost, like I said, it's almost better to just be in Canada for some because, I don't know, it's not easy getting into these leagues, these USLs, these NISAs, uh, especially uh, they're starting to make Can- Canadians um, internationals in these leagues as well. So. Right. Think about it. you're on the same scale as uh, whatever Einsteiger of whoever international mm-hmm. Kaka. You're you, you're you're taking up one boss now. So uh, yeah, not to say it can't be done, but um, yeah, you know, it may be easier to uh, start yeah. in Canada. Makes it tough, right? Because they those spots generally go to the the big names, the marquee mm-hmm. players, the ones who are you know maybe winding down their career but have been playing in Europe. Yeah, exactly. They they have the they have the CV. They may be like on their their end, but they have uh, shows to to definitely warrant that that spot, right? So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, what where's next for you then? How long do you spend uh, there playing PDL, and then what what happens next? So, uh, we kind of skipped ahead a little bit. Like it all happened so fast. So, like it's like I joined this team. Mm-hmm. This Toronto Lynx team played 17s, the 20s, and the PDL kind of like mixed together. Yep. But at the same time, right, I'm 17, 
so that's the time you'd get a scholarship right mm -hmm. and uh, the crazy thing is is obviously i didn't anticipate joining uh toronto links or anything i never anticipated going to america right so my grades were not even close to up our with what they had to be so i was going to these uh these showcases as a the toronto Lynx team and i was like getting the top like cleveland state like all d1s and like let's say we went to like michigan michigan state all the top d1s around that area that showed up were like all like inquiring about me mm -hmm. but like i was nowhere near ac the academics to go there right. because even though like intelligent i never i never i never took school like that seriously because again i was never on this trajectory right mm -hmm. now as there's so many inf so much information yay in and what you need and requirements when i like 10 11 12 years ago i didn't have it right i just didn't have any of that guidance and um i've never i, I didn't see anyone doing it so i didn't know right so mm -hmm. now there's so many examples there's so many programs and um, recruitment tools and uh, agencies that help but back then it, they weren't really around right mm -hmm. so yeah i was going to these things and they they impressed with me but i just didn't have the grades so what I had to do was I had to uh, a Canadian school, basically, a Canadian college, uh, to bond up, and that 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 was a that was a, another struggle in itself because I had to commute to the school, um, I had to take the the transportation, I had to take the subway. Uh, the teachers didn't care about my athletics; they didn't care that I had. Uh, a showcase on Saturday or a showcase on Friday. If I had to leave school and like miss as an assignment, I would ask like, "Hey, can I write the assignment earlier?" Zero, right? So it's like little things like that. It made it so much harder to kind of climb out of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Just getting those grades and getting like just getting that it just became really hard. They made it really hard on me to get out. Like yeah. it took a lot of pers perseverance to to fight with the teachers, the academics, the school, well, as well as obviously still going to these showcases and remaining relevant, right? Because mm -hmm. we were still taking trips because there's still other guys that, you know, want to get and stuff. Yeah. So it was a, a tough time for sure. Yeah. And very, very hard. And how's your family during that time? You, you, is your family supportive of what you're trying to do? Uh, yeah. They're fine because I was young, right? I was younger. We're talking 17. I probably just turned 18. Mm -hmm. I'm in college, right, as well. So there's no, it's not like I was doing nothing. I was still going to school mm -hmm. and also playing football. So they were fine with it. They were supportive. Yeah. But it was tough on me because I don't like school. Like, I didn't like school. I didn't like the gen eds. I didn't like the commute. Yeah. I didn't like that the teachers weren't, uh, understanding like i didn't like it right mm. so for like a year and a half i had to deal with a lot of stuff i did not like to try yeah. to just get to my end goal was yeah. getting into university which wasn't even promised because you know just because they were offered uh, a year whatever a year and a half ago those things coaches change like those things aren't guaranteed right so yeah, yeah. And, and what was the kind of kept you going and you know obviously there's a lot of things going up against you there and it would have been very easy just to give up and to go do you know what it's just too hard like what what was it that kept you going did you have this just a desire that i'm gonna be a footballer um i'm trying to think uh what kept me going during those times i think that i was still training and with the academy that you know there was still a football day. there was still exhibitions there was still showcases so there was still a reason to keep going mm -hmm. but they did not make it easy at all right mm. <laughs> at all mm. and uh none of the teachers made it easy it was a it was a resounding thing it wasn't like one teacher it was all the yeah. teachers right yeah, just that, that just, everywhere you go that just made it hellish mm. think about it like something simple like can i write a test early i have a, i have a combine on friday uh, i have to leave thursday can i write it on one mm. no you get a zero right now think about how that's affecting your GPA. Mm. 
when you're only there for your GPA. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, it was kind of like, it was tough. Yeah. But yeah, it was just being, uh, being young, just being kind of resilient and young and uh, you still have friends. You still have a good, a decent, a good family. You still playing football, you're still playing and you're still young. So that's mm. kind of, I guess, what kept me, kept me in it. Yeah. And so just interested, because you mentioned the combines and stuff a few times there. So with mm-hmm. the academy that you're with, they would, am I right in understanding that they would take, so the academy is like a team and then they're going mm-hmm. and putting, entering that team into all these different kind of combines and competitions or whatever to put you guys in the shop window. Is that what happened? Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, so maybe this combine wasn't the right word. Uh, a showcase tournament is the more specific term. A yeah. showcase of, so yeah, you'll play against teams and you these will come and watch you guys from that area. So if you go to New York, you'll probably have five, six, seven schools from New York there, whatever. Yeah. To Dallas, you know, things like these type of tournaments. And those are, those are, were my main ways of like kind of getting noticed when I was young, going to those tournaments with my team. Okay. Yeah. Obviously right. performing well as part of it too. So, so what what's the next step then where where do you go from there so the like kind of last and final step to get before i went to university was uh i i i you it's ironic okay you asked that question. i was almost like kind of done i was kind of like fed up at a point mm-hmm. um i think i had gotten hurt in the summertime mm-hmm. so during all whatever doing my school and I had got hurt in the summertime. We were playing Chicago Fire and I just got like burnt out and I got hurt mm-hmm. without going into too much detail. Like it was like just dehydration. Yeah. Just, I was doing a lot, right? I was playing on PDL U20s. I was playing a lot of minutes. Like I was like, I was being overused at that point. Like, but I was you're not going to turn down the minutes. You're not going to turn down the opportunities and you're not going to let uh, the academy down, the team down. Mm-hmm. when they, they're on these trips for free, they're bringing you to Chicago and things like that. But uh, I played a U20, or so I played a PDL game against Chicago Fire. Mm-hmm. I walked to the locker room after the game. It was probably 90 degrees outside. So after I played 90 minutes, I walked to the locker room. I sat down for probably two minutes. I ate a granola bar, maybe took a sip of water, and I walked right back out for a U20 game. <laughs> and when I'm saying these are top, top players at the time, right? PDL, yeah, like yeah. this is Chicago Fire. They're like fringe MLS players, right? And I'm only 18 and it's turf and it's 90 degrees. And like, we got worked. We did get worked that day. Yeah. So I'm doing a lot of running, right? So don't try that at home, kids. But that was <laughs> just one of those things where uh, I ended up getting like a dehydration type thing. Yeah, where it just kind of like deflated me. Like I didn't feel like playing the rest of that uh, season, right? And so taking some time off, like there was no games or anything, right? So I was home, right? And so that was kind of like a point where I, there was a chance I was kind of done there. Mm-hmm. But um, what ended up happening is uh, my team ended up calling. After, like, some time away from them, they ended up calling me back, and I just kind of reconnected and saying, like, what's going on, right? Because I wasn't playing soccer for a good probably five months. I wasn't playing after that uh, summer injury. Or, mm-hmm. right. And uh, I was I was playing, ironically enough, just running around again like a kid playing, like, like football, like, in a league like that, like uh, an American football league. Like, I wasn't even playing. I didn't get a soccer ball for months and months and months. Right. But I just kind of got that weird itch. Uh, to play right mm. and so I recontacted my academy kind of seeing what's going on and then over time you go to one training session and you start to feel good mm. you start to get rhythm right and you're kind of like okay you're starting to the coaches like you they're, they're happy to see you, you kind of start get feeling good again right mm. and so there was an opportunity to go to uh, um, Dallas Cup which is uh, one of the biggest uh, showcases in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, teams like Arsenal, like U U nineteen, go teams from Chile, team from wherever. Like uh, let's say Bayern U 19s like all the top 
European will send their young players and stuff to go play there. So we went to this tournament and uh, I did well. I did my, th and um, actually, I got a couple offers, but like, you know, it wasn't, you talk to a couple coaches, a couple JUCOs, a couple of this and that. It's not anything crazy, right? But then, like, uh, after the last game, I got an email from a coach with the offer and everything already, the breakdown and everything. Like, no no questions, no, you know, you know, oh, we can maybe do this. It was just a offer in there. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, this might be my last chance. So I just kind of like, I might as well take this, right? Yeah. And I knew nothing about where it was. I was just like this is the last chance, right? Because think about it now, I'm like 18 or 19, mm. right? Because of all that time wasted in like the college and, you know, all that time I've been doing that, it's it's a it's a far cry from what I was doing when I was 17 and I was like ready to go right away. I didn't have the grades, but now, you know. Mm. So some time had passed. So I just took that offer. Yeah. And, and yeah. with these kind of offers, what kind of things are we? This is for a co uh, for a university, and it's saying like yeah. we will, you know, we'll pay your uh, um, your course fees or whatever your scholarship fees. Sorry, and is it that mm. kind of thing? That's the kind of offers they put in front of you. Is that yeah? It's like uh, okay, you'll get an offer for seventy five percent, for example, and okay. this will cover X Y cover tuition, your meal plan. This yeah. have to cover housing or something that's yeah. an example of how gotcha. it would go yeah, yeah so that was the type of email i got and mm -hmm. i just kind of jumped on the opportunity yeah and where did that take you which your university so that, that took me to uh, northeastern state university in uh, oklahoma which be which is a d2 program yeah and so i'd never been to oklahoma never heard of oklahoma at the time uh like, this is how kind of young and naive I was. I kind of, like, looked at a map, and I was like, oh, okay, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the record, and it was, like, a losing record. And uh, this was a new coach, and I'm just like, okay, well, if we have a new coach, uh, we should be better than the last year. So, like, that's all I needed, really. And I was like, okay, that works for me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh... – so I guess you talk us through that then, your time at the at Oklahoma, Northeast State. How was that? Uh, it's, it's rocky because um, I think originally when the coach saw me, I was in the game and we were pressing. So I was kind of actually up top, right? Right. And I was kind of like, you know, doing a lot up top, playing off, playing out wide, doing a lot, using pace because yeah. we were chasing, right? And like, if we lost, we were knocked out of the tournament. It was something like that, right? And so he kind of, he obviously had a position, but at the same time he had uh, visions and images of me being like, obviously I'm six three four two hundred, 200. So he's thinking like, I could be like a, a top striker, right? target, man. which maybe, yeah, he's not necessarily wrong. Like I did have the, some tools to actually do that, but it wasn't my position. Right. Yeah. So when I went there, I was kind of like, utility player to start um so it wasn't easy right because I, I didn't obviously my position center back so I'm there I'm kind of playing up top then I never really played up top but and it was a pressing system a lot of running you know it's just different right it's just not something I uh, I wasn't ready for it I wasn't yeah. ready for there um you know because think about it, after the two years of waiting to get there, you you start to celebrate when you get it, right? You're like, ah, da, da, and you don't prepare for it. Really, I should have been preparing. So I went there unprepared, essentially, for what was coming. Yeah. And, yeah. So it was a lot to handle at first. Yeah. So, and how many years do you spend there? So I spent the four years there. So I, I graduated and everything did. Yeah. Well, so obviously that that when you first get there, it's a bit of a wake up call that first season when you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Jesus, I'm, I'm not quite ready yeah. for this. What does that make you do during the the off season leading into uh, your second? Oh, I went so hard. Then my next, my ne as soon as that uh, season ended, because I also had nicks and injuries and stuff like that. But after that, I was mad. Like I was, I was mad. Like I was working out hard. I was like doing. X amount of squash lunges a day. I was running. 
I hate running. I was running. I was doing sprints. I was doing ball work. I was so mad that I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, live up to what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Right. Cause I went there for a reason, right? I didn't go there to hang out. Right. I yeah. went there for like a real reason. And I was so mad that I let myself down. Yeah. And so, yeah, that whole spring and that whole, and then I went home and played PDL and played really well. That's, you know, and like the whole, it was like a whole stretch of like seven, eight, nine months where I was like mad and just ready to come back and like prove myself basically. And so when I came back again, it was a little bit of adversity because you got to fight for stuff, right? You're not gifted anything. I wasn't gifted it when I came back, even though I had a good summer, Mm -hmm. a good spring and everything, I still had to fight a little bit. But as soon as I got my opportunity, I never didn't start a game basically Mm -hmm. for the remainder of the whole time, the whole fall, the whole spring. So probably as soon as I got put into the lineup, I was I was in it for the next 70 games or whatever. Like, I was like the staple. I became like the staple as soon as I got in. Yeah, yeah. So you took that. I guess you had a bit of self-analysis. You realized you didn't live up to it. Right, focus now, attention, take that fire and use that fire and turn it into just... You yeah. have focused work ethic but it's just, working. just you had to i just had a choice i just couldn't i couldn't go out like that i couldn't go out thinking with these guys thinking i wasn't who i knew right but them thinking i was a bum coming like from canada like there's no way mm. so uh, how yeah, so i became i mean when yes, you're sir. when you're in your training phase through that period then so what are the type of things are you doing or how long are you spending each day working are you, are you on the ball every day is it obviously you got your gym program worked out as well what type of things talk us through that a bit um more focused i was just like doing a lot of building up my muscles a lot of things that maybe done in the past that you forget about just a lot of core just getting ready just getting stronger faster neater touches on the ball just at all really nothing there was nothing specific per se mm. but just like uh, I was in I'd be I, I just I, I developed a ring right where I just got up and did it right mm. and you know if it was cold outside I just took the ball and I went outside it didn't matter what was going on right I just got a bigger jacket I just put on leggings like like, oh, like I just got in a routine and when when and I just stuck to it mm. oh, and, consistency's key. and then it made me want to keep going because I was seeing results right yeah yeah that consistency is key and it's so easy to make excuses right it's it, the, the benefits of doing things come on those days when you don't want to do it it's still going out yeah. and actually doing it right because if you only ever act when you feel like you you want to do it yeah, you're never going to get anywhere. Yeah, I could have easily made excuses. There was a lot of days where it was snowing. Mm. Still got the cones, still got the jacket, still got my cleats. It's snowing out. It's rain. It's wet. Mm. There's a party happening. Mm. Yeah. There's no lights on. Yeah. There's a million. There's a lot of days where I went out there when it wasn't it wasn't uh, ideal to really be out there, but you, I just did it right. Well, the conditions were were never really like, oh, it's so sweet. It's such a hot day. Da, da, da. Like I was, I was. If you wait for those conditions, you're never going to get anywhere. Exactly right. So, so um, playing college then for four years is there? Mm-hmm. Is that? Do you go from there? What happens when you leave the the university, or is, is something happen along that four year period? What's the next thing? So basically, like, like I said, as soon as I got in the team, I became like, I got a lot of notoriety. Um, I won a lot of awards. I did a lot of things like that. But ironically enough, it didn't really give me a buzz that uh, I maybe thought or a buzz that maybe the kids would get today with the social media and stuff like that. The same someone doing the same things I was doing back then would probably be like all over some type of social media page and getting like a lot of um, features and stuff like that. But like, mm. I got all awards and like nothing really, no one was really waiting at my doorstep or anything, right? Um, so I remember graduating and there was a, a combine, info sport combine and uh, I, I don't know if it's still around, but I was like the 
probably the most competitive combine I've ever been to in my life. There's in um in 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 Canada and like U.S. Like I swear, all the best players were there. If you were a D three like All American, D someone, if you didn't go to the MLS combine, you were at that that info sport combine. You were there, and it was top tier. And it was like it was like I don't know how to describe it. It was like. I don't want to use the term like hellish, but it was like a battle. It was like the biggest battle ever. Yeah, like, you've got to be on every your game. game, every possession, every. Hmm? You're going to be on your game, right? You've got the best players yeah. around the country. Everyone is good. Everyone was good. Mm-hmm. Every team was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was hot. It was so hot. It was so hot outside. It was January 1st or something or around there, but it was so hot. It was in Florida. Mm-hmm. It was so hot. And you had to play big minutes. The way the teams were split up, you had to play big minutes. And I remember so many people like cramping out, getting injured. My even myself, I picked up a knock. Mm-hmm. I played a, I played a game, like literally a game. It happened. Like I strained my hamstring in the game, and like just so pumped up, I didn't notice. Mm-hmm. And I went home, still didn't notice really. Just dead tired with uh, at my friend's house because we had a friend. We went down with like three of us, right? So we had a friend that lived in Florida. Yeah. And I just remember being, and just like there's another day left, and I was just felt so dead. <laughs> my hamstring was hurting. Everything was hurting. And so I went back. I played that next game, but then like I was out for like a month. Like I looked back behind my thing. My hamstring was like blue, black, like all this type of thing and um from that uh combine i actually had a trial set up like after two in florida at the time which was uh fort lauderdale strikers right and so i couldn't even attend that like that's how like yeah so but it was a battle like that's that that was like the original wake-up call uh at a at a a college and um it wasn't so much a call for me like because i'm already athletic i was already at that d1 level Mm. regardless but like let's say the guys i came with that were not as athletic super technical but not that athletic they seen like you could see you could see it watching the game Mm. wow the levels is ridiculous between Mm. guys that were good in like the whatever the d2 and the guys that were killing anyone just like those the movements was just way different right you see it just it just like stuck out so brightly on the pitch. Yeah, it's very athletic, isn't it over there? I think it's super it's, athletic. Yeah, super athletic. Um, yeah, but I, that that fits me. I am an athlete myself. Mm. I I do fit into that American style of play, so mm. I felt comfortable. I yeah. felt fine. I did good, but yeah, so, it was. It was so, tough. so your trial, you can't attend your trial because you picked up an injury. So what? How does that make mm. you feel? Because do you, do you feel like you're now missing out on an opportunity, or uh, to sign for a club because of you've attended yeah. this combine? Or yeah, after the combine, I was feeling good. Like I, I you know, kind of sat down for a second and realized like how bad my hamstring kind of was. Like I was like icing it. I was like doing everything he, anything you could do, ibuprofen, whatever. Like I was doing to try to like make it on time for that but I just couldn't mm. and so mm. yeah like I was missing out and I became worried because yeah opportunities like that uh they don't really just pop up right because to see that there was 120 good excellent players at that combine just lets you know the quality mm. um trying to get into a team so if you could right out of university sneak onto a roster or whatever they be you know you got those those kind of those chances yeah that's right it's, and you got to think that's just one combine right you got around the world you know it's a global market yeah. isn't it really so yeah got how many millions of players all fighting for those limited spots and every every combine is different you have to reprove yourself like whatever i did in florida didn't matter to the next combine i go to mm. it's a whole new crop of new hungry players that also want a contract as well right Mm. So it's very, it's very competitive um, at those type of levels. If you're just kind of going to trials and stuff and not getting a direct signing and mm. it's very competitive. Mm. So what, what's next then? Tell us. 
I'm just trying to think back. So from there, I guess I was waiting around Florida for a bit, so nothing happened. So I think I went back to Oklahoma and um, just kind of trying to figure things out, right? You kind of feel I didn't have an agent, you know, like I had a good collegiate, really good collegiate career, but no agent, no type of agencies around that, no, no, no real leads. Um, I think I remember going to, at the time, a Tulsa Roughnecks open trial. Again, don't know anyone. Like, you're just kind of a face showing up. Nothing really came of it. Then I um, got a little look by um, OKC Energy. I got, a, like, not a trial, but, like, I got to go train with them and just see 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 how it is and just see the levels and it was good but I felt good but again like it's really competitive like they don't they didn't need me on their roster like I was just a collegiate player like coming out like I uh, I wasn't bad but you know what I mean like there was not a necessity to like come grab me up out of nowhere so um from there no, I think just remember taking some time off and reflecting a little bit. Um, yeah. Right. And w how do you go from there to signing for Michigan Stars, for example? I'm assuming there's a, there's a, a block we haven't covered, yeah. right? Yeah. So basically, I ended up having to settle with playing um, MPSL, right? Which is <laughs> semi-pro in the States. So I was playing with the Tulsa Athletics. Mm -hmm. and uh those are, it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty professional environment i'll i'll, I'll give them that so but the athletic, it's a good environment they do things pretty properly so just again kind of obviously once you're out of college you have to get something right and so i just jumped on that mm -hmm. um and uh kind of got my groove back kind of got my confidence back my flow back play 12 games or whatever, you start to feel good, you start to fit, you start to feel lean. Um, we ended up having a, a really excellent season in the MPSL. I ended up having a very good season. Um, I got voted like second team supporters or something like that. So like, I, I really enjoyed myself there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so on the last game of the season, it was uh, like a playoff game, kind of a do or die game. Uh, I actually scored a really big goal in that game, but uh, fortunately we ended up getting knocked one. Uh, it was a crazy game. We actually probably hit the post, no exaggeration, maybe 10 times, completely <laughs> dominated them, completely just dominated them. I don't know how we lost, but yeah. everything happens for a reason because from that game, it was someone that I knew was watching that has connections in Mexico. Right. So... If if we won that game, I wouldn't have been able to go to Mexico. So right. it just happens that we lost that game and I ended up going to Mexico. Yeah. So I went to Mexico for some type of uh, a tournament, like a showcase tournament again. Like I was on like an all-star team, basically. Mm -hmm. So we finished the season and this is how quick football is, right? Uh, probably three days after the season. I'm on a bus from Oklahoma to Mexico. Like, we took a bus across the border. Like With, with a team you don't know anyone else in the squad? The, the team is in Mexico already. No one speaks English. So it's just me, my friend, and this this guy, which is Oscar. Yeah. Who, who's an older guy, but yeah. Um, uh, he took us over. And so, yeah. So now I'm in Mexico and random... Uh, a random town uh, called uh, Miguel Alza, uh, Zacatecas in Mexico. And there's a, they're hosting a tournament, a yearly tournament where uh, Santos is uh, like reserve team is coming and uh, a team called Necaxa is coming and another team, another good team's coming. So like three really, really good high level teams are coming. Like they're, they're sending the reserves or whatever to come play. And so I get there, like, we warm up one day, and then, okay, the next day is, like, the game. So I play in the game, and I'm starting. The the first game, I, I score. I score a goal against uh, Santos's B team. So I don't know how 
how much you follow Liga and Mech is something, but you know, not much. Pretty, pretty good. The first team's good, but not much. Yeah, look, look it up after this, but yeah. So, uh, are you frozen? Or are you good? Yeah, no, I think we've, I think you froze. Well, we both yeah, frozen now. Not great. I but anyways, yeah, so I scored. Okay. Uh, okay now. No. Uh, yeah, you're back. There we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I scored in that game. So I'm flying high. I just went from PSL. Now I'm in Mexico. Just having the time of my life. Really, just really enjoying, really enjoying football. Um, we ended up coming out second in the tournament, but. I think that was a that was a real wake up call. Like, wow, like I could really I could really do this. Yeah. Like, I, if I can play with these guys over here in Mexico, I can yeah. feel like I could really do this, right? So, how old are you at this point? So at this point, I was twenty five. Right, twenty five, and this is where you yeah. start to actually believe that you know what? Yeah. Right here, I'm. I can. Mm-hmm. Do I started to believe because I'm not gonna go against university, but man, like. I mean, I went in at 19, you're kind of done at 23, 24. Like, it takes a lot out of that kind of mm. a good chunk where, let's say, I could have been playing lower league Europe or something like that, right? Mm. So, but it is what it is, right? It happened. And I have a degree, so it is what it is. But, yeah, um, I started to really believe after that. Like, I was flying high in confidence. And then uh, from there, when I went back that next, like, December – is when I got connected to the USL and the Tulsa Roughnecks. So that's kind of when I got introduced to the pro game. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, and how does that come about then for you? Is it because you've been playing in Mexico, someone's seen you and you've performed well? Or like, do you have an agent that's worked for you to get you that opportunity? You've done it yourself? Have you reached out to them? How does that come around? Sorry, you have to say that again. Yeah. yeah. The internet connection wasn't great. Yeah, no worries. So how, how does, I'm one, what I'm wondering is how does that um, opportunity come about? Is it because you've been playing in Mexico and you've played, performed really well, so they've approached you? Do you have an agent that's working these opportunities out for you? Or did you reach out to them yourself? Um, the Tulsa Roughnecks? Yeah. At the, at the time, no, I didn't have an agent working for me. I had been working with a couple agents and it, it just didn't work out um, prior. Like, uh, I did skip over some other things by accident, but yeah, nothing too in detail. But uh, yeah, uh, I didn't have an agent. It's more just general networking. Yeah. Like anyone watching this will know uh, it takes more than just skill in soccer. You also got to network and talk to people. Yeah, yeah. so it was more networking through uh, programs like LinkedIn, Facebook, stuff like that yeah. to get a hold of uh, the appropriate people. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And uh, so Tulsa, how does that go for you? You have a good season? Tulsa was good. Um, Tulsa was a good I – met, I met a lot of good people in Tulsa. Um, I had a good mentor. His name is Kosuke Kumar. Uh, he played in the MLS and things like that. Kosuke, watches this. I miss you, bro. Uh, but, uh, no. Nah. He he's a good mentor. He's a good guy. He showed me a lot about work work ethic and uh, what to be a. Pro. Honestly, I didn't know, right? I didn't really know what it meant to be a pro, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, gym sessions, the the extra technical work, the ball work, the the amount of work put in with that guy over that course of the year I was with him was ridiculous. Like mm-hmm. I never ever trained that hard in my life, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, so just on that, what, what insight could you give, you know, people watching this who you know, the majority won't know what it takes to be a pro, what it's like to be a pro? Could, is there any, what yeah. can you give them? What advice can you give them? It's hard to say, right? Because there's levels to it, right? Like, there's still pros that just wake up and go to training and train and go home and you're still a pro. Mm-hmm. But there's the pros that come early get their gym workout in, get their activation in, get the touches, train, then get touches after, 
mm-hmm. and then you know let's say recovery stretch like there's levels to it right there's no necessarily oh you're a pro you're not a pro if you do this or you don't do this but there's there's a high level of there's a very high level of professionalism you could reach um coming in early to training leaving late to training uh touch the ball extra sprints it's one of those weird things like it's 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 progressive right it's not like you're gonna see improvement the next day Mm -hmm. but if you do that for seven months Mm -hmm. by the end of the season like you should be really sharp and flying and feeling really good right because you've touched the ball more than everyone else generally speaking Mm -hmm. so those are the type of values and things he showed me kind of like the work ethic and he was older at the time and the fact that if i was 25 26 and he's 33, but he's working so hard, then why do it, right? If he's way older than me, he's done, right? But it was, yeah, it was a lot. But I, I took those values with me, and I, I have all those drills ahead. I have all the work. I still remember everything, right? So it was a good, good time. And how important is it to have a mentor, do you think? Um... It's really important. Um, Like I said, like these type of tools, there's so many agencies and tools now available like I didn't have, right? Even three years ago, so many companies, new companies, new new, uh, travel teams, new new agencies that will get guys together and take you places. Like a lot of these things weren't really around. So it's important to have guidance. Uh, A lot of people don't think they could do it until they see someone they really know could do it right Mm. because it seems impossible until your best friend does it or your friend does it or this and that because if you don't see it a lot of people have to see it to believe it so if you don't see it you're just going to be like i can't do it you're just going to make excuses right Mm -hmm. so uh a mentor helps a lot uh just to bounce questions off them about anything footballing goals, whatever questions you might have if they're older and they've more than you and they've traveled more than you uh they're gonna have more answers they're gonna have you know they're gonna be more knowledgeable than you mm-hmm. so right it's important if you can if you can get one it's i would say yeah sure yeah that's great advice so maybe i'm skipping ahead here so tell me if i am and we can go back but how does it come about that you make your or you get called up to represent Barbados? Uh, you're not really skipping ahead. So with Barbados, um, I had been on the radar a little bit years prior. I had been on the radar a bit. I had actually been invited to a tournament. I think it was 2016. You could probably still find the article. I was in a camp, like invited to a camp or and 16 but uh based on like government stuff like unrelated to football like getting your passport um becoming a citizen then that's 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 why i wasn't playing for barbados let's say five years earlier because again i wanted to be there when i was 23 24 but yet only got there 28 it's just these little things right that you can't really control like I was planning to be there four years earlier but um it was um from playing in Tulsa but yeah I was already on the radar but that last little call up was like yeah I was getting I got a little minutes in Tulsa towards the end and it's like okay you're you know you warrant to call up at least right how does that how do you find out about that being called up and then how does that make you feel um i don't know i'm not really i'm not really someone that gets uh too excited about hitting like goals and stuff sometimes i don't know it's like it was already planned i wasn't that excited like like i said it was like in the works from when i was 20 now i'm 28 or 27 at the time whatever i was Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like kind of like uh like a sigh like finally like yeah so it's a bit more of a relief like at last yeah it's like it's like yeah it's like oh finally i got the passport like after three years of all this stuff and working like finally like finally there finally i could 
what it's about. It was, yeah, it was kind of like that kind of emotion. Yeah, I can, I can get that. I can understand that. It still has to be some kind of, um, you know, because it's very, especially with football, right? You might have got the, the initial call up three years ago, but a lot can happen in football. You, mm -hmm. you may fall by the wayside. You may decide you don't want to play anymore. Exactly. Better players coming up, you know, to take your spot. Mm -hmm. So to still maintain that, um, you know, warranting the call up three years later, I think it's a, a great mm -hmm. thing to you, you know, to show your consistency and your level of playing. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you you hit it on the head. Uh, a lot could happen in that time frame, but uh, I kind of stayed focused on. Uh, I wanted it to happen, right? So I was gonna make it happen, and so I just had to. Just one of those things, like off a checklist, like you had to. I had just had to do it before, like, you know, I just couldn't quit on the goal, right? Yeah. And uh, and how many have you? How many games have you had for them? Have you played? I haven't got to play actually so again this has come down to kind of timing like right. I've been on the bench for both games yeah uh, the first time uh I was coming back like from like a turf toe type thing turf toe type injury so I had got it at the like the very last game of the season in Tulsa and so coming back you're just trying to fight through injury right and yeah kind of the 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 tough thing about uh like the smaller country some people might not understand so if you're thinking of a big country like in England and a thing like that like uh you have your club team obviously and then you get called up mm -hmm. to your national team but for the local players in Barbados the national team is kind of like their second team right if they're not playing anywhere as we're speaking right now they're probably training for example right right and so the continuity think about the continuity the coach the staff mm. they're going at it every day and the level right and so it's tough to break into that if i'm going there for three four days you have to really be on in on your job to really break into that 11. yeah right so yeah it's a, it's been a challenge the, the the two times i did get an opportunity to get called up Mm. say I could have played but you got to think about it like that you're coming into an established team already mm. so what are you doing to kind of what are you doing different to to convince the coach in a, a, a five-day window a four-day window yeah. you really got to be you know mm. yeah that, you got a, so that's kinda, like that who's a regular who's there full time who's, there, who's been there six months seven months eight months training three times a week right so it's kind of like and it's not like they're players they're, they're very good technical athletic players mm. um they just happen to be born there that's why maybe they haven't left because it's not easy right but yeah. don't don't think because they're there they can't play they're very 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 good players there mm -hmm. but uh, it's hard to get opportunities to, as to an leave, experience right? for you to to be a part of how how did you i guess talk, talk I like about that how did I like the experience? Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah, to me, to still be around an, an international, you know, set up yeah. and... It's, it's different. It's, 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 it's an experience that not many can say they've had. It's yeah. obviously an experience you can't take away from me, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, playing is great, but there's still a lot that comes with traveling there, being with the team, eating, the tactics, the training everything kind of I learned from there it's still it's still with me right all the trainings the the just the way things are right it's all knowledge and experience that could be packaged and told and 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 and, and you know there's still a lot of value in what I've seen and what I've heard from mm -hmm. just going there mm -hmm. it, it adds a lot of it adds a lot of value to you even if you didn't get to get 90 minutes or you didn't make a huge impact no, you can There's still, still a lot of value. Yeah, you yeah. Can still learn from that experience. Mm, still a ton of ton to learn about, about preparation, about coming better prepared next time, mm. what to expect next time, um, things like that. Oh, I, I didn't feel great. I'm not going to eat time. I'm going to bring this food. I'm going to do this. Because it's way different there, right? It's so hot. Um, 
it's different. You know, it's like it's like 30 degrees like every day, all day. There's like some there's no see. Like there's little little things that you wouldn't think about, right? That are just so can be so taxing, right? If you've been like in a room all day, no AC, and then you gotta go train at seven at night at night. It's little things like that uh little experiences that you yeah. just learn from and you think okay what could i do next time that um maybe i'll be fresher at training or could i stay little things right yeah yeah that sounds like hell to me playing football in 30 degree heat <laughs> it's <laughs> tough man it's, it's tough it's, it's, not right? like, the weather. it's tough man you think it's nice because it's nice and hot, but it never it never goes away. Yeah, no it, it never, yeah. Even when it rains, it's it's like hot rain, right? It's like yeah, no escape. Goes between twenty five, thirty all night, all day. It doesn't matter. Like there's no there's no relief really, unless you're in the AC building. There's yeah. not a lot of relief. So, so talk to us a bit about because um, you're obviously with Michigan Stars right now. Yeah. Professional setup, professional team. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. So, what does mm-hmm. your what does your schedule look like? What's the schedule of a professional footballer who's playing at this level? Um, just when I wake up, type thing. Well, I guess essentially, like how many days how many days a week is the team training? Are you doing gym sessions and then training as well? Do you do your own your own um, workouts on top of team workouts like what what is the the life of a professional monday to friday or monday to sunday so obviously everyone's different and there's obviously no set schedule per se like there's not like okay we're gonna train six times a week or seven it's really whatever the coach says and generally the coach probably gonna react off like the players how they're reacting the body if you have games if you have uh, exhibition games, things like that. But generally, let's say I'd wake up probably pretty early, probably like a 7, 7.30. Um, let's say training's at 10. I get some food, some oatmeal, an egg, something like that. Um, I'd obviously whatever, get showered, whatever, dress. Um, I'd head to the facility. In the facility, there's a gym type area with bikes and things like that. So I generally probably start riding the bike, getting a little bit loose, foam roll a little bit, stretch a little bit, and then get into a workout of some sort, um, whether upper body, lower body, something like that. And uh, yeah, that would be that. I'd do the workout and then I'd probably go more intubation, like more pre, pre-training. pre Like and then if I needed to see the trainer for an extra stretch or something, trainer and then you're kind of out on the pitch, moving around a little, touching the ball, and then uh, training will start. You kind of train. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's either I work out before or after. So I'm probably after. Um, I'd go ride up a little bit, um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on a bike, uh, foam roll, stretch, and then that's kind of it for the training portion. I'd go get, get, a, get lunch, right? Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, later in the day, there might be a, t- a second session, depending on the time. It could be another session. But if there's no other extra session, you just relax, really. And uh, you know, maybe just pull off, like, uh, decompress, I guess you can say, play some video games, write, um, message people back, things like that, right? Yeah. And I, I, would, doing- be, I would say that. Are you doing much um, outside of the team? So are you doing any individual sessions on top of what the team would be doing as well? Um, in terms of like, well, ball like work and things like that? Some extra ball work or maybe some extra you know, conditioning work or anything. I'm, I'm sure if you're, you've got back-to-back schedules. Well, and- like I said, like... Sorry, you cut out. Um, cut out it really depends on the workload of the training session and how I feel, right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's on the workload of the training sessions generally and kind yeah. of how my body's feeling. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, usually after training, get a few touches. Some guys like to long ball, guys like to do juggling, some drills. Um, in Michigan, no, I generally wouldn't like go home and then come back later. Mm-hmm. I generally wouldn't do that. I'd 
if anything, I just came early, leave late type thing, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. Gotcha. So. Um, so we got um, some questions from our community. So I put it out there that we were going to be talking. If anyone had any questions that they'd like to ask someone like yourself. Uh, and I've got a couple of specific ones here. I think it might, might be a fan, actually. Because, and if you don't mind me asking this question, right. but they're asking if you're going to be staying at Michigan Stars for the next upcoming season. <laughs> That's an interesting one. <laughs> uh, well, in football, I mean, you never really know. Uh, yeah. if you go back, yeah, it'd be nice to go back. Uh, but you, we just have to see, right? It's a, it's a very big year coming up for me, mm-hmm. potentially. Uh, there's a Gold Cup. There's World Cup qualifier. Um, Barbados is in the mix for all these type of really big tournaments so mm-hmm. I got to be somewhere where I'm playing and making an impact and uh, yeah so we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens in the next few months yeah awesome. but uh, either way I, I, I enjoyed Michigan and obviously I'm, I'm grateful for every every professional and any footballing opportunity you get you got to be you got to be grateful for it so I'm obviously grateful for for them uh, believing in me and having me out mm-hmm. Brilliant. Um, someone else wants to know, do you follow a strict diet whilst in season? Do I follow a strict diet? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, ironically enough, I am now, as I'm getting older, getting on a nutrition plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say I, I do follow. I, I ha- like I haven't, but I am super consistent. But when I've been eating good for so many years, uh, like having a donut or something doesn't really do anything to me. Yeah. A bag of chips one year. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really uh, affect me too much. Sorry about that. Yeah, it doesn't really affect me. It's more about consistency, right? If you're, if you're eating vegetables mm. the whole year, eating good, eating good, and then one day you want to have a bag of chips, nothing's going to happen, right? No, um, more yeah. about consistency and the, the the balance of your diet, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, as I'm, uh, I do, I do, I do pay attention, and it it is important. It is important to eat well and eat right. Uh, it very, very much is. So I would encourage young boys and stuff to to start to start looking after uh, what what you're putting in your body, right? Mm-hmm. For sure. And do the club have any say on on that to you? Do they give you any guidance or? any kind of restrictions or you just free um uh, in a sense it's more it's more preference like let's say your your coach is a fan of like let's say white bread or like you know things like that he doesn't find value in it or he doesn't find value in cakes no one's going to be following you around your house but they're they're gonna uh they're going to the team meals and things like that, they're going to definitely make sure that none of that is around, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And the, so is, do you have any advice that you would give to a younger player looking to come up and follow, you know, into or get to where you are, you know, essentially a professional footballer who's been called up to represent the country? What advice would you give to any young player? Uh, to younger players, I would say keep just if you're really passionate about the game just just keep and keep working and uh good things will happen uh look on youtube just pay attention to this other channels that have good information that have interviews that have uh, insight into the game right um can't think of a better time to be young than right now in terms of all the technology and all the tools and all the resources and age available i mean there's really there's really no excuses to to you know not have and or not have a nutrition it's all really it's all there it's all free online really if you just if you look close right? mm-hmm. so yeah i would say yeah just keep training hard obviously network network networking to uh you got to be skillful but you also you also have to have connections in some 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 way some form whether it's just getting someone's phone number or, uh, you know, having a old coaches, not mm. old teammates, you know, just, just keep in touch with anyone, you know, that is, is football related because you never know where they might be 
in a few years or you never know who uh their dad might know or something like that right so yeah that's right yeah. i think that's something that gets overlooked by a lot of people is um the the network that they already have reaching out and utilizing that and how many exactly. opportunities that develops for, for other players exactly mm. i mean and that's that's in all facets of life uh, connections mm. is important in anything in podcasting and basketball soccer football any sport any any anything you need you need to have some type of connections and it doesn't hurt right to to know people to ask people questions it hurts right they can only say no or they can only not answer but it will never hurt to ask right yeah, yeah that's so right. i encourage people to be outgoing and ask and uh, just keep working hard and uh, keep dreaming you never know life changes quickly as you heard from this interview, you never know. You're at home one day, and the next day you're you're, you're playing somewhere. So mm. you just keep keep grinding, and uh, you'll get to where you go. Yeah. That's fun. fantastic, mate. And that probably is a, a great spot to to wrap this up with that message because I think that's hit the nail on the head, really. But um, is there anything else that you'd like to share or you'd like to add that you think that maybe we didn't cover? Uh no, I think I think we covered all bases. I think yeah, the story is pretty well covered, and the advice is pretty pretty well covered. Where where can um people find you if they want to follow your journey and see what's going on with your career? Where's the best place for them to find you? So I'd say the best place is uh, Instagram. So I guess I, sh I should I should plug my Instagram right Definitely now. Definitely should hundred percent. Um, yeah. So my Instagram is T Smith dot 91 so t s m i t h dot 91 and i'm terrence smith on instagram so yeah that is that is my page where i'll post I'll post my things post my football workouts occasionally yeah so you're gonna know you're gonna see my modeling pictures and things like that but uh yeah take take, take a look at the page don't don't be don't be scared to throw me a like or a comment on the page awesome, man. well i really appreciate you coming on and giving up your time uh for us and for sharing your journey through football i think it's uh it's great to hear and i think hopefully it can you know others can hear that and use it as a bit of inspiration and aspirations to to do you know what you've done and play the game at a professional level and get a call up for a for a country which is incredible only a few people can say yeah. so well yeah, done thank you very much for your time and hopefully we can catch up with you soon.